coming out this evening um, and joining us for this presentation. Um, we are very blessed to um, have a presenter with us who is an expert in this field. Um, Christian Morris is amazing, and um, you are going to uh, really enjoy the presentation that she has for you this evening. Um, she will um, leave a little bit of time at the end to answer any questions, but please remember that because of purple laws and all those wonderful things, um, we can't answer questions specific to your child, but we can answer general questions. If you have questions specific to your child, you'll need them to direct them to me at a later time. Uh, but thank you so much. And we are ready to get started. I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much. So yeah, so um, I'm very happy to be here and excited to talk to you. Thank you guys for taking time out of your evening. Um, and hopefully maybe there's some folks who are kind of logging in online. Do you need me to stay in a certain range here for like- I can I, see you, your hand is just getting cut off where the clicker is right okay, there. Okay. And then I can, you can have you like have all, all the way to the other screen. Yep, right okay. now where that, okay. that's off screen, right there. Okay, yep. I will do my best. I do tend to pace, <laughs> so hopefully we can, we can do this. Um, so anyway, so yeah, so we're gonna talk a little bit about, about parenting these neurodivergent gifted kids and how we can really support them and understand them and, um, Help them kind of grow and, and be successful. So um, just a little bit about, about me and my background. Um, so, so I was a gifted ed teacher. Um, well, I was an elementary school teacher first, and then I taught, got a master's and taught in gifted ed. I taught in at both elementary and middle school um, classroom settings. And once I was um, in there, I really loved what I was doing. I loved the curriculum. I loved working with the kids. I actually taught in a program for a little while, that was a program for exceptionally gifted students. That was their full-time classroom. But what I what I knew that those kids really needed was they needed the social and emotional support that wasn't they weren't always getting. That was my passion while I was there. So I went back and got a second master's degree in counseling and family therapy. I worked for a little bit as a school counselor, but now primarily I'm a, a mental health clinician in private practice, and I support um, gifted, twice exceptional, and neurodivergent kids and their families. Um, and, and so I kind of come at all of this from an angle of having been in the classroom. I also have three children who are ages 14, 12, and seven. The older two are identified as twice exceptional. The younger one is identified as gifted. And, and I'm sure that the other part of that twice exceptionality is, is coming along at some point in time. Um, and so, and also I, I, you know, I was a twice exceptional student. So I was identified as gifted and participated in a gifted program. I was also um, diagnosed with ADHD when I was in fifth grade. And um, I always kind of share this just to kind of put things in the context, but I feel like ADHD at that point in time, like in the early 90s, was was kind of where autism is now, where we're really starting to understand it a lot more. Um, I was diagnosed at a time that girls really weren't diagnosed with ADHD very often. And I feel like autism is kind of that way too. But also I know that for myself, looking back, if I were a child today, Autism would have been one of the diagnostic questions that we would have been looking at because I recognize a lot of those traits um, in myself and I understand how that kind of impacts things. So with that all being said, you know, I, I think having that experience is what drove me to support the kids and the families that I do because it was hard being a 2E kid. And it was it was hard being in school and having teachers that didn't understand me. And, and my mother was a special educator and thank goodness because not that she understood me, <laughs> But she at least knew how to navigate the system in some ways and try to get me the supports that I needed. So um, all of that led me to, like I said, what I do today. And so I have two books that I've written. So the first one is Teaching Twice Exceptional Learners in Today's Classroom. And so that's obviously for educators, just about how to recognize and support 2E kids. And then I have a, a parenting book, Raising Twice Exceptional Children, a Handbook for Parents of Neurodivergent Gifted Kids. And we're going to talk through some of the different things that I have in this book tonight. And then I'm also the host of the Neurodiversity Podcast. And so um, the podcast has grown like crazy. My husband is actually a video and audio producer. He's a voice actor primarily, actually. And so we already had the studio in our house. So we started this back in January of 2018 and it has grown like crazy. So if you're looking for some good resources, if you like to listen to podcasts, we have great episodes on giftedness, on price exceptionality, and just on other topics related to neurodiversity in general, not only that are really good for parents and about kids, but also I think even for adults, even reflecting who may be neurodivergent themselves and kind of understanding that. 
So um, what I'm going to talk about first is in my parenting book, as I was writing it and I was trying to formulate exactly how I wanted to really share the information that I thought would be most useful for parents, um, was I wanted to, to, you know, I kind of talked about like, what does neurodiversity mean? Kind of what do those different diagnoses mean? How do we co-parent, which is very difficult because sometimes people have different views, but then one segment of the book is specifically related to the five skills that I feel like all gifted and 2E kids really need to develop. And um, basically the way that I formulated those was I kind of just really thought through what are the skills, what are the treatment goals that I'm constantly working on with my clients in my office? What are the things that kids really need and how can I kind of distill that and crystallize it and provide it to parents so that you can coach those skills as well at home? So the number one skill that I felt like was really important was self-advocacy. And I actually, as I was brainstorming all of these different skills, I kind of was, um, originally I was actually going to have self-advocacy as kind of the last skill of the five, but I ended up moving it up the list and, and labeling it as the very first skill because it's so important that our kids learn to recognize their own needs and learn how to advocate for those needs. So if they are advocating to their teachers, to their peers, to us as parents, that's a really important skill for them to be able to communicate what their needs are. And that can look like a lot of different things. It doesn't always have to be verbal self-advocacy. So if you have a kiddo who struggles with communicating, especially when they get really overwhelmed with things, you know, self-advocacy can look like a, a, a hand gesture, a thumbs up or a thumbs down, or writing notes back and forth with like little check boxes. There can be a lot of different ways that we can do this, but we want to empower kids to be able to self-advocate. Part of the reason that that's really important is because kids who are neurodivergent, people who are neurodivergent, will be neurodivergent throughout their lifetime. You don't you don't outgrow autism. You're not cured from ADHD. If you're dyslexic, the Broca's area part of your brain that is responsible for that sound symbol connection, it's always going to process information differently. You might learn a ton of different coping skills and strategies. You might get into a job that really goes towards your strengths so that you're not feeling like you're you know, in a situation that is, <laughs> is difficult to manage. But but being neurodivergent is lifelong. And so self-advocacy is a huge part of this key to recognizing what our needs are, whether you're asking a boss or a partner or a friend or whatever to help you use those skills. So one of the things that I, I talk about that kind of goes along with that is, is self-scaffolding. So specifically in education, when we're talking about scaffolding, what we're talking about is, is the framework that we use to help kids build certain skills. So for example, um, we, we need a task to be at the just right challenge level. It can't be too difficult. We also don't want it to be too easy. When we teach kids how to self-advocate, we can help them advocate for where they need that challenge to be. Um, and this is interesting, especially for 2E kids, because if, it, if a task is too difficult, obviously they're going to give up. They're going to spin, you know, they're going to spin their wheels if they don't have any supports there. But also if it's too easy, it's really hard to feel motivated about something that is not at the appropriate challenge level. Um, but then the flips, then as we kind of, as they grow older and as they are adults, being able to ask for and receive accommodations or supports that can provide that scaffolding so that tasks that they have to do at work or at home that are at that just right challenge level, they can do that on their own. They can do that independently. So we really want them to be able to, to do that. And that's kind of this next piece is just building independence. It's, we want our 2E kids to feel that they have, um, you know, the ability to, to make changes in their lives and, and have those, those skills. And realistically, we, we want them to be independent. Sometimes we want them to be less independent in the moment, and we would like them to just do what we ask them to do. Um, but ultimately, that 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 independent streak is is an asset, and we really want them to to have that. Um, flexible thinking is also a huge part of this, because when you're talking about self advocacy, 
really the skills that are necessary, um, you know, include the fact that you have to recognize what your need is. You have to know what would help. You have to know who to ask. And a lot of times you have to come up with, when I say you have to know what would help, sometimes that means you have to know multiple things that would help because your first idea may not work. So when we can coach some of that cognitive flexibility, when we can brainstorm ideas, um, we can really help, help kids kind of be able to do that self-advocacy piece. One of the things that I tell families quite often that I'm working with in the office is that I, I definitely don't have all of the answers for your kid or for your family. Um, but I've talked to a lot of people over the years and I have a lot of ideas and we can brainstorm some new things. And so we can come up with a variety of options and figure out what might work best. So that's where that flexible thinking comes in because if, if somebody gets stuck, if there's only one solution and that one solution isn't working, you're kind of at a standstill. So we wanna be able to be flexible with our thinking and, and encourage that self-advocacy. And sometimes if you find that your child is self-advocating and you're looking at them and going, this is a terrible idea. It is definitely not gonna work out the way that they think. You know what? Give it a shot. It, I mean, if it's, if it's safe and if it's a low stakes situation, let's give them the permission to try it and fail. Because, and, and we don't have to be, be judgy about it. We don't have to tell them in advance, I think this is a terrible idea. I don't think you should go ahead with it. But when we can say, you know what? I don't know. I never thought of that idea. Let's give it a shot and see what happens. We're, we're teaching them the chance that it's okay to have that flexible thinking, that it's okay to take risks. And if it doesn't work, then we just try something else. We come up with a new idea there. So we want them to use that flexible thinking. And that just goes along with this next piece here, which is the problem solving. How do we help with this? A lot of, a lot of our twice exceptional kids are brilliant. They have so much information. They know all of the things <laughs> about a lot of different things. But when it comes to problem solving and being flexible with their thinking, they just kind of get, st get stuck. It's that logic, like just like on a daily basis. Um, and I think that that's, that's what we really want to encourage them to do. So if they have an idea and they have some flexible thinking and they're advocating for it, we can get them to self-advocate. Like, let's give them that chance to be independent there. Okay. So the next skill that I think is really important is emotional regulation. So emotional regulation is huge. And I feel like it is one thing that whether a kiddo is, is twice exceptional or not, um, like maybe they're just gifted, whatever, you know, whatever that means. Um, emotional regulation can be really difficult for them for, for a variety of reasons. But we want to really help them build that skill. So when we're talking about emotional regulation, you know, we can have hyper arousal, which is like the escalation, the really, you know, big emotions. And we can have the hypo arousal, which is kind of the shutdown or the, you know, kind of the, the withdrawing. And when we help kids recognize what those skills are, or I'm sorry, what those, what those states are like for them when they can start to recognize them, then we can help them start to build those particular skills. And so I think that um, a lot of times this can be really <laughs> overwhelming when we're in the moment, when our kids are in the moment, it's overwhelming for them as well. But there are some ways that we can do this. So some things that we need to kind of consider when we're talking about emotional regulation, we have all the feels. <laughs> um, so first of all, when we're, in, when we're at school, one of the things that really influences emotional regulation is whether or not a child's in an appropriate classroom setting. So just like I was talking about, if something is too easy or too hard, we, that's not the best classroom setting. We really want it to be a, a setting where it's flexible for them, where they can be appropriately challenged, but also when a teacher kind of knows when to back off a little bit, right? And not, and not push so that they can regulate that. So if you have a kiddo who's not in an appropriate classroom setting, that can definitely be something that exacerbates the emotional dysregulation. Um, and so it's something to be aware of. Perfectionism is an, another piece that really influences our bright kids. So there are a variety of reasons why gifted individuals tend to have perfectionistic, perfection, I'm gonna try it again, perfectionistic tendencies. 
So um, for example, one of the reasons is that when you have young kids who are very bright, who learn things by osmosis without even being taught, and they know all of the things, they get very used to being correct about stuff. And so there can be this self-belief that develops when they realize that school is easy, stuff is easy, I learn super fast. So when that kind of integrates into their dialogue that they have internally, and they realize, I get praise for these things. I do them really well. They come really easily. I'm smart. This is all good. All of a sudden, when something is not easy, they don't know how to handle that. So that's one aspect of the perfectionism. The other piece of it just is kind of in a similar vein, but when you know that you can do something well, most people want to do it well. Most people want to get to that point where they're really being perfect. Alfred Adler is a psychologist and he has a quote that I love, which talks about how all of life, meaning humanity, but all of, all of life is a striving for perfection. And he doesn't mean perfection in the sense of like literal perfection. What he's really talking about is the motivation to do better. However, when you're an idealist and you see the way things could be, or you see how your work could look, or you know what it could be like, it, it, gets, it can be very black and white which can lead to some of that perfectionism. The other thing I want you to know about perfectionism is that kids can be perfectionistic about some things and not others. So they can be perfectionistic about whether or not their sibling is following the rules, but not about cleaning their room, right? They can be perfectionistic about um, their math homework that they do really well and they want that to be perfect, but they don't care at all about writing. You know, there can, it can be, just in some areas. So just because your child doesn't have an immaculate room does not mean that they're not a perfectionist. And another piece that goes along with that is sometimes it comes, it leads to avoidance of those tasks because if it can't be perfect, I don't wanna do it. So, we have, so that's one factor that comes along with just being gifted that can influence this emotional dysregulation. As we talk about, so the, these are kind of factors for gifted kids in general. Then of course, twice exceptionality is a major part of this. Um, and so a lot of times kids who are neurodivergent on top of being also gifted um, have a lot of difficulty with this. And then the other piece about the emotional regulation is just this heightened awareness of the world that comes along with being gifted, but not having the life experience behind it to put it into context. If I'm aware of the war that's going on in Ukraine, or if I hear about, um, you know, <laughs> about climate change, and I've got a lot of climate anxiety, but I don't have any any power or, or any um, understanding of a context or any of those pieces, that's really overwhelming as a child. And I think as adults, with a lot of those different things, if there's something like that, that we are aware of in the world, we generally have some opportunity to do something, to have a voice, whether it's through getting involved in a cause or um, just talking to other, you know, people who kind of understand it at the same level that we do, or donating, you know, whatever it might be, we can take that sense of helplessness and take action on it. A lot of times kids don't have that opportunity. And so that can be really overwhelming for them. And again, lead to some of this emotional dysregulation, um, if that's something that's really, really difficult for them. That's also sometimes where you see some of that existential um, anxiety or awareness in, in bright kids where they really struggle with that. So how can we help them kind of manage all of the feels? <laughs> um, so in the book, I came up with a four-step process to help kids learn how to manage their emotions. And again, I, I feel like this is just a good framework. One of the things that we miss so often with gifted kids is we forget to teach them how to do things because they have so much awareness and they have so much cognitive ability and they pick up on so many things around in, in the world, um, but then we don't break down the simple things for them. And then we get frustrated when they don't know how to do those things. So this is, this is terminology that you can use. These are skills that you can use and we can kind of break this down. Um, I think for those who might be watching the live stream, I think perhaps the, the presentation, I've got like some things that I'm going to like that are going to show up here on this. And I don't think it showed up on that particular PDF. So just FYI. So the first step here 
This is called the I can method. Sorry. Oh, it says it up there. Good. The I can method for regulating emotions. So the I is investigate. Okay. So this is about building awareness around the dysregulation and recognizing and understanding those signals as they build. How do we help kids know that the train is coming before it gets to the station? Like we really want to make sure that they can predict what types of situations might cause them dysregulation, because then that brings us back to our previous skill, which is self-advocacy. Because if I can predict what's going to make me feel dysregulated, then I can self-advocate and try to, to overcome that before it becomes an issue. So when we're working with kids and helping them to investigate this, one of the things that I really like to do, um, and I think I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more in kind of a different framework, but um, if we look at this and talk to the kids and say, we're going to look at this like it's a scientific method. We're going to pretend that we are scientists and we're going to just collect some data. When we use that framework, when we're talking with kids, first of all, all of the kids know the scientific method. Who doesn't like to do a little science experiment, right? But it takes it out of any sort of judgmental zone where you're not doing the right thing or you're not regulating your emotions. You need to be able to manage this. And I don't understand why you're struggling with it. So. What we can do here is we can say, let's come up with a hypothesis or let's just come up with something we're going to observe. What are we going to collect some data on? And then we can empower kids to do that. They can collect that data about when are the times that they're getting dysregulated? When are the times that they're really having a hard time? And once we can do this, we're, we're really just helping them recognize that first. Part of this might be helping them re re recognize the internal body sensations that go along with being dysregulated. And one of the things to know about twice exceptional kids is that because they often have a lot of sensory um, differences in how they process sensory experiences in general, this can be really difficult. So um, all of us know about the five senses, right? We have our visual sense, olfactory, gustatory, tactile, and auditory. Those are the five that we're all taught in elementary school. Everybody knows those five. There are three more types of sensory processing systems that we have in our body. And so um, the first one is the vestibular sense. So the vestibular sense has to do with how our body is moving and how we sense movement. So for example, I didn't realize this until the pandemic when we were on Zoom and I have my office chair, it's a swivel chair. And apparently if I'm sitting in that swivel chair, almost 100% of the time I am rocking, swiveling back and forth. I also made the connection that that's part of the reason why I'm so good with babies because I do this a lot. <laughs> it's why I'm pacing back and forth. Like my body just kind of seeks that sensory sensation. And so when we think about this, this is kind of a way to regulate emotions. So when we can help kids, that could be something that we could investigate. Like what are some of the sensory body movement things that you need? Um, it could be, um, the vestibular sense could be the kid who's, who's leaning back on the chair and trying to balance the chair here. Um, it could, there, there are like a lot of things that kind of go along with it. It's kids who are very hypersensitive. Well, let me think here. Hypersensitive would be sensory like avoidant. So like my son is very averse to any sort of like roller coaster or spinny thing or whatever. Like he doesn't like that type of a sensation in that sort of movement. And so he would be more sensory avoidant in that way. So um, the next sense is the proprioceptive sense. So proprioception has to do with where your body is in space in relation to other things. So my daughter, who's, who's 12 pounds and, I'm sorry, 12 years old <laughs> and about 75 pounds, like she's like, I mean, she's tall and, and skinny, but you would think that she weighs <laughs> three times as much as she actually does when she walks around in the house because she's constantly stomping. She's, she kind of doesn't have a real awareness of how much force she's using and how much space there is between her feet and the floor. And so that's a proprioceptive piece of information. The other, another example of proprioception would be if I'm always running into things or you know, my, the distance that I use when I'm talking to people, that's related to our proprioceptive sense. Um, I don't know that that one's, as related necessarily to emotional dysregulation, but I just want to give that context. But then the final one 
that is very much related to emotional regulation is our interoceptive sense. Our interoceptive sense is how we interpret our internal body signals and what they tell us about how we're feeling or what's happening around us. So a great example of this was a client who I had who was a high school student at this time. And she would talk about the times that she would get really anxious about things. And she, she really struggled with interpreting those internal body sensations. And she would tell me, by the time my stomach hurts, it hurts really, really bad. But I can't tell in my mind whether it hurts because I'm hungry, I'm sick, I'm anxious, or I have to go to the bathroom. She couldn't discern those sensations. Her body, her brain was, was under responsive. She didn't get those same sensations and interpret them in the same way. Well, if you're uh, somebody who has, has poor interoceptive skills, you don't recognize those as much. Think about how you recognize when you're emotionally dysregulated. A lot of us might think <laughs> that it's our thoughts. It's like we can recognize what our thoughts are and therefore that drives what our emotions are. But a lot of current research is really showing it's actually kind of the other direction. A lot of it has to do with how our body sensations are created and how our brain interprets those that then drives our emotions and our thoughts. I mean, it happens almost simultaneously, but if you think about it, the other day, you know, I was in the house and I don't know what I was doing. It was just the evening and I was walking downstairs and I realized like the sequence of events was I felt the sensation in my body of my chest kind of getting tight and my stomach kind of getting this kind of a little bit, not really queasy. It wasn't quite, it's almost too strong of a word for it, but basically I realized I was feeling anxious. I'm like, why, what's this feeling? Why am I, I'm anxious. Why am I anxious? And then I had to like go through, it's like, what's, what's on my mind that is making me feel anxious. If we realize where those interoceptive skills are key, we can help to investigate better what those, what those emotionally dysregulating situations might be. Um, the other thing is if you have a kiddo who is very, um, who struggles with this, sometimes those emotions build so much and they're kind of unaware of them and then it explodes because they don't always have those interoceptive pieces. So something that you can do with a kiddo who struggles with interoception and regulating those emotions is you can start to verbalize some things for them and help them make some connections there. So like, for example, I noticed that your fists are clenched. That usually, that means that your muscles are probably pretty tight. Do you notice that? What happens if you release those hands? And this seems to be a sign to me that you're feeling stressed out or whatever it might be. But when we observe those, we can help them, even if they might not notice the sensation, we can help them be aware of what those observable traits are and that can help them build that skill. Um, but recognizing that, that all of those different sensory pieces can really influence how we regulate emotions is important for our kids. We can help them, help guide them, but it can also help us understand where they're coming from with some of those things. Okay, so we can investigate. We can build awareness around that dis dysregulation. So the C for the ICANN method is communicate. How do we communicate this? And so the first step in communicating about it is building emotional literacy. Can I label the emotions that I'm having? I know it sounds super basic, but here's one of the things about gifted kids. Happy, sad, mad, what, I don't know, whatever else, right? So it, it's not enough. Those words don't really match how they're feeling. And kind of going along with that perfectionism or that accuracy seeking, finding the just right emotion word is really important for kids. They like nuance. They want to know. And sometimes it's mixed emotions. So how do we build emotional literacy with kids? We can give them the words to use. One tool that I really like to use is, um, and you can Google it, you can find a million of these, um, a vocabulary of emotions or an emotion wheel. You might have seen it depending on what types of things you follow on social media. Um, it's become more popular now in, in the counseling field, but basically a wheel of emotions is, um, usually has about three tiers. And so you have the centerpiece, which basically has the six main emotions, which is like inside out um, characters <laughs> from that Pixar movie, plus surprise, 
they had they would say that surprise is one of the one of the main emotions and that's what psychology generally agrees upon is the six main emotions that we experience and then there's a second tier that has these spokes that go out and kind of narrows it down and then a third tier again with more spokes and so you have all these happy happy emotions and you have kind of this wedge with all the happy emotions and it's like glad enthusiastic um I don't know, whatever else would be synonyms for that, but it, it gives those just right emotion words. Another tool though, that I probably even like more than that. If you look up vocabulary of emotions is a, a chart. It has like eight columns and three rows, but, and it, so it breaks down the emotions into six plus two. I don't remember what the other two, how they broke it down specifically, but it breaks it down into intense, moderate, and mild emotions. Mm -hmm. And so then you have this huge menu of emotion words that you can use. And so when you're talking to your child and you're wanting to communicate about this, you can use this tool, put it on your refrigerator, have it available, laminate it. And they can then help, it can help them to find the just right emotion word. One of the skills that is often used in, in um, <laughs> the clinical mental health or, or just in counseling, whatever it might be, is the name it to tame it strategy. So in the book, The Whole Brain Child, I think that was one of the first places that I specifically saw this talked about. But if you can take yourself in a moment and assess how you're feeling and label that emotion, it actually takes you out of that emotion just enough to get a little bit of distance from it. And when you label it, it kind of takes like, wow, I'm feeling really angry right now. It's like, oh, I'm feeling angry. It gets you out of that you know, rage or whatever it is that you're, what you're experiencing. And it helps you to just think about it at a metacognitive level. So it takes some of the power out of that emotion, it takes a little bit of the, you know, where we can then make some decisions about what to do. The other piece about communicating is they have to know who's the safe person to communicate with, right? Is it you? Is it a teacher? Who can they talk to when they are feeling dysregulated? Um, who can they ask for help? Again, goes back to that self-advocacy piece. So that's really important. So the A and the I can method for regulating emotions is activate. So we need to activate the problem solving skills and use cognitive flexibility to assess and determine the best, the best strategies. So what specifically can I use? What are the tools that I have that can help me to re-regulate my emotions? Can I analyze the size of the problem? Is the size of the problem proportional to my reaction to the problem? One of the things that I love to do with this that, that kids sometimes really get into, especially gifted kids, because I don't know, it's very logical. And so they kind of, they kind of, you know, get into this. It also has to do with money. It's called emotional price tagging. So basically where you can brainstorm a list of possible topics that would be dysregulating and you assign them a cost, a price value. And then you determine is the cost of those problems like, are you, are you overspending with your reaction? It's one of the terms I like to use with this when we usually the baseline is a penny. And we try to say, what's a penny problem? Like, where, where are we here with the penny problems? And a lot of times there are things that are way down there. And a lot of times, especially after we're regulated and we start talking about it, it's like, what was your reaction like? It's like, you kind of spent like a dollar <laughs> on this emotional reaction. Was that really worth it? Or was, you know, what kind of problem was it? Sometimes they're like, it was a nickel problem or a quarter problem, but a lot of times it's a penny problem. And so that can give some additional terminology that you can use. So that's one way to kind of focus on, um, you know, just kind of size the problem and the reaction. It might be something um, like about trying to figure out, you know, I need to, to, ask for some help, self-advocate for something. I need to find a different solution for this problem. Um, or I just need to take a break. I don't know, what, whatever it could be, but being able to activate those problem solving skills. And then the last part is navigating. So getting through the dysregulation and returning to that regulated state. So if I've been able to solve the problem, if I've been able to assess and determine those best strategies, putting them into use, taking a break, doing some breathing exercises, whatever that might be. And then, and then after the other piece of this navigate part is that we need to debrief about it. We need to talk about it. What worked, what didn't. It's really difficult to find the just right time to talk about things because on the one hand, if you talk about it too soon, you're just going to, you know, stoke that fire and it's going to be worse. Um, if you wait too long, it was ancient history. 
I don't know what the just right spot is for your child, but hopefully you can find it where you're talking about it. It's always funny. Sometimes people will come into the office and they're like, oh, this thing just happened yesterday or just happened today. I'm like, oh, good. I'm like, well, not good that it happened. <laughs> just good that it's recent enough that we can really work through it while it's a little more fresh. So when we use this framework, we can talk kids through this. Again, let's use that explicit instruction. Let's talk to kids. What does it mean to investigate? What does it mean to communicate, activate, and then navigate and help them visualize that process and plan for that process in advance so that they can then be able to utilize it more independently as they go forward. I think, again, the more we break things down for kids, the better it is. And so we can be really explicit with this instruction for them. So the next skill is executive functioning. And executive functioning is skills like time management, uh, organization, metacognition, all of these different pieces. And I think that, um, especially for our twice exceptional kids, but also even just gifted kids who aren't necessarily twice exceptional, this can be really difficult. So the example that I like to use when I'm talking about executive functioning and explaining what that is, is one of um, a symphony. So if you have ever attended a symphony and you're there before they start their performance, the orchestra is there and they're playing their instruments, they're all tuning their instruments, playing in different tempos, different keys, all these different pieces all at the same time. And it's kind of just a cacophony of a lot of different noises. When the conductor comes up and begins to bring the orchestra together and, um, and starts them all playing music together, that's when we hear the arrangements and, and you know the actual music. But the conductor is analogous to our executive functioning. It's the piece that's up here in this brain, that's the prefrontal cortex that brings everything online. And if we don't have good executive functioning skills, things are just happening, <laughs> they're misfiring. We might have this piece that's going well, but then this piece that's a little bit late, or we don't have the brakes that slow us down. And so we do something impulsively. So we need that executive functioning. So one thing that's really interesting, um, I mentioned that so this is all the prefrontal cortex. This is where all of those executive functioning skills are taking place. But it's um, with gifted kids, there's research that shows that gifted kids, not even twice exceptional kids, have executive functioning skills that sometimes lag. So the reason for this is the gray matter around the brain is the cerebral cortex. And so it varies in thickness development as kids develop through different ages. Um, so essentially, oh, where's my other, oh, I have it. Okay. Well, I'm just gonna have to explain to you. I don't have my chart in here. Sorry. So what they've done though, is they can measure the cerebral cortex through MRI technology and they've measured it and they looked at different cognitive skills of different, um, aged children. Essentially when kids are very young, the cerebral cortex is pretty thick. And this is associated with the time of life where kids are learning really rapidly. They're just absorbing information, learning from all of these different places, like faster than we can keep up with it. As kids get older and that cerebral cortex begins to thin, that's when our executive functioning skills begin to come online. So that rapid learning slows down a little bit. Um, our brain starts to kind of prune some of those different, different um, neural pathways and our, our prefrontal cortex is also then growing and developing and bringing some of those executive function skills online. Depending on a child's cognitive ability, that cerebral cortex thins at a different rate. So while for many children, executive functioning skills like organization and time management start to begin to come online around age six, eight, 10, something like that, because gifted kids hang on to that thick cerebral cortex, which allows them to learn so rapidly, they, they keep that longer, those executive functioning skills don't come online until later. So instead of six, eight, 10, it's like more like 10, 12, 14. So a lot of gifted kids might lag with some of those things, not all gifted kids. I mean, there are some gifted kids who just have it all together from like the moment they were born. I don't know how they do it all, you know, but, but in general though, that's part of that asynchronous development that happens with, with our gifted kids. So for twice exceptional kids who might struggle with executive functioning on top of that, you can see how they're at a disadvantage there as far as building those skills. 
So that can be really um, something to consider as we're going forward and working with them. So let's talk about what the executive functioning skills are. So executive functioning skills can be broken into two main categories. So the first one is decision-making skills. So these are tasks like planning and prioritizing, I would add here, um, working memory, which is holding that information in our short-term memory, time management, so estimating how long a time will uh, how long a task will take and being able to to manipulate what our schedule is like in order to start the things in order to get all of the things done um, organization and then metacognition so metacognition is that ability to think about thinking and for what it's worth a lot of our gifted and two-week kids have pretty strong metacognitive skills that's a strength that we can really leverage with them and help them build some of these other skills that we need them to work on so when we talk about second piece here, we're talking about behavioral regulation skills. So behavioral regulation skills, response inhibition, that's essentially impulse control, um, shifting focus. So being able to take what I'm focused on here and then stop doing that thing and start doing something else in a certain amount of time. Yeah, it's, I mean, sounds easy, much harder than, than you think. I mean, the kid, it's time to turn off the video games, it's time for dinner. I mean, that type of shifting focus can be really difficult. It can also be at school too, where it's like going from one subject to the other. Task persistence and sustained attention are similar, except sustained attention really is about how long can you sit and focus for a sh a, an uninterrupted amount of time. So can you sit here for an hour, an hour and a half and listen to me talk for that same amount, for that whole amount of time, or do you have a trouble sustaining that attention? Can you sit in class for 10 minutes, 15 minutes during a lesson, or do you get distracted? And then task persistence is about um, a task that has multiple steps and being able to follow it through to the very end. So it might be a long-term project, but it might have even just be something throughout the day that has a couple of different steps that you have to be able to do. Task initiation is just getting started on things. So are you procrastinating or are you getting started on the task? And then cognitive flexibility. And so just being able to look at things from different ways. This involves perspective taking, understanding others' point of view. Um, it can also just be shifting from like, I have this idea. Okay, that idea is not working. Okay, so can I, do I have any flexibility to find something else that might work? But what we really wanna try to do is we want to we want to leverage this metacognition as much as we can to help these kids build the skills that they need. So the metacognitive cycle is something that um, that I developed as I was working with kids in my office, and um, I talk about this I think more specifically in the educator book, but there are some other similar things in the parenting book as well. So the metacognitive cycle is really about helping to close. It, it's a goal setting process that brings kids into the into this conversation that we can then use to help them build those skills. And again, like I was mentioning earlier, in a very non-judgmental kind of open-ended way. So when we are doing this though, we really wanna work on closing the gaps, okay? So we're closing the gaps in their skills. So that means our process here is going to be very gradual. This is not gonna, like our kids didn't start having these struggles overnight and they're not gonna get fixed as overnight. So we really want to know that we have to go at their particular pace and move at the pace that works for them. Progress is progress. And sometimes it's two steps forward and one step back. And that's okay, because the more we talk about it and the more we normalize this process for them, the better they're going to be able to do handle it in the future. These are adjustable. So if, if we're setting a goal with them to work on work through the metacognitive process, and it's too difficult or it's too easy, we can adjust it. We can change it. There's, and, and sometimes it, we might have to adjust it further than we thought, but that's okay. And again, we want to normalize that for our kids. It's personalized because it's something that is just specific to them. And it's simple. When we think about what a kid's goals might be or what they're struggling with, we want to narrow it down very, very clearly and, and specifically so it's very simple so that we can do that data collection that I was mentioning earlier. So here are some examples. Um, and, and for what it's worth, these examples that I'll, I'll go through here are good both for, you can use it for emotional regulation, you could use it really for any goal that you wanna work, work 
work through. So I think I have at least one example here that we'll talk through that kind of relates back to emotional regulation, although it's also kind of a cognitive flexibility thing for executive functioning, and then a couple with executive functioning skills and how we can help kids build those. But we could, we could utilize this and change it for whatever it might be. So the metacognitive cycle has three steps. The first one is self-monitoring. So what am I doing? We're just working on collecting some data. We're gathering information. The next step is self-evaluating. So how am I doing? So judging the effectiveness of the current strategy. So after we've collected the data, we need to look at the data and we need to evaluate it. And then the last part is self-regulating. So what do I need to change and developing new strategies to help manage that particular situation? You'll notice that the key word in all three of these pieces is self. We want to empower kids to be in charge of this on their own. And again, if we take the framework of looking at this like as though it's a scientific method, that's a really good way to talk to kids about this. Like, hey, we're just gonna collect some data. We're gonna come up with a method. We're gonna even come up with a hypothesis. Like, what do we think might be influencing this particular situation? And we're gonna collect some data. Then we're gonna evaluate the data. And then we're gonna then we're gonna come up and we're gonna revise our hypothesis. What worked? What do we need to regulate? What, what do we need to do to self-regulate and then keep this process going? So here's an example. And for what it's worth, these are these are real, well, names and details have been changed to protect the innocent, but the charts that I'm going to show you for the data collection piece are we actually used with kids. So we used to do some groups for um, executive functioning and some different things at the office. And so some of those came from this and others just came from work I was doing with clients. So Alex is a ninth grade student. He often experiences very intense emotions and struggles with black and white thinking, leading to emotional reactions that are out of proportion for the situation. As a high school student, this is beginning to cause significant problems at school with his teachers and peers. So how can we use the metacognitive process to help him? So um, Alex is a gifted um, autistic student. And he was really having a lot of trouble with this, especially as he got to high school. You could see how that was causing a lot of social um, difficulties for him because he would kind of either shut down or blow up or somewhere <laughs> or both, kind of depending on you know one person and the other. So we decided to kind of just talk through this. So what do you think's happening? What's going on? What, what are, you know, do you notice any patterns? And I don't know if you've ever talked to your kids about these things, but half the time they're like, I don't know, no clue. Not an idea, not even one, one, not even one idea. So we decided for Alex, because that was kind of where this was for him. I think the other thing that I observed with Alex was that a lot of times his dysregulation or frustration was displaced. It was like something would happen and then it wasn't, like he would kind of hold it together for that thing, but then it was like the next thing that would really cause the, the dysregulation. So we decided, so when am I generally struggling with getting upset? What other factors are occurring at this time? That was just our data collection piece, right? So our hypothesis is something is causing this dysregulation. I don't know what it is. Um, and so, and when I say hypothesis, obviously that's a very loose term, but it's like, what is our question? What are we trying to, what are we trying to find out here? So this was the little chart that we came up with. This is where the simplicity comes in. We're just looking at very little information. I don't need him to write a diary entry. I don't need him to reflect on it. As many check boxes as possible. So as little writing as necessary. Date, time of day, environment, and then a brief description, like two or three words, right? And so he was able to do this. Now he, he was able to do this without prompting. There are some kids who might need some support with like, hey, let's make sure to fill out the little chart or whatever. We really wanna have them self-evaluate. It should, like if this was something that he was working on with a parent, for example, I would discourage the parent from giving any feedback on this other than, hey, I noticed you were dysregulated today. Let's fill out your chart. And, and then let him go on his own because it's really about his process if we end up being the arbiters of when it was happening and what was going on, we've now removed that power. We've now removed that autonomy there for them. So what we discovered for Alex was that the common factor was that he was getting super frustrated in class, but he didn't want to ask for help. So then that would then snowball into all these other things. And then he would get mad at his peers 
or he would get frustrated when he would be, he would get in trouble for reading his book in class because he had been frustrated. So he didn't want to do the work. So then he would read his book in class and then we get in trouble for that. And then he'd get upset about not being able to read the book. But as we looked through it and we collected that data and we looked for patterns, we noticed that that's what it was. So then, okay, so what are we going to do with this? We need to come up with a plan. We need to self-regulate. So we came up with a new strategy. So this really was more along the lines of a true quote unquote hypothesis, right? Because we already had some data there. So we developed a plan with several of his teachers who he trusted, only the because they went to this with other, other um, teachers, but so for planned check-ins to support the self-advocacy. So he had certain times of the day in certain classes that he was always going to go and check in with the teacher and just ask a question. And then we collected data on that. Like, how did that go? Were you able to do it? Was there anything that was difficult about this? Just to kind of build that skill of asking, like normalizing the asking for help because that was so difficult for him. And so then we decided to take, collect some data on this. Now, sometimes you might do this and might realize like, okay, this doesn't really, like we're looking at the wrong thing or we're not collecting the data or my child's really avoidant about collecting this particular data. That's okay. That's the adjustable part <laughs> and the gradual part. So just rethink it, look, look at it a different way and figure out what might work. So a couple of examples here um, that I always like to share. One of them is, um, I've, I remember a, a child who we were working with, this was a younger child and they were one of the thing that they decided they were really struggling with that they kept getting in trouble for was calling out in class. And so we wanted to just build some awareness. We wanted to help them self monitor when they were calling out in class without raising their hand or whatever. So we just came up with a little index card, a little T chart that they put on their little folder. It was, it was just taped there. And the goal was, I did, I think, I guess I did this when I was a school counselor because I saw this, this kiddo on a regular basis. So we could talk about it based on, on a daily basis. And um, if she caught herself calling out, she would put Italian one mark, like before, like she, she caught herself before she did it. So she stopped herself. Or if she called out and didn't catch herself, then she put a tally mark on the other side. So she was just trying to build that awareness and bring it to her consciousness of when she was calling out when she wasn't supposed to. And one of the questions I got was, well, what if she, what if she lies? What if it's not accurate? And my response was, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's not my purpose for this. My purpose for this is for her to feel like she can monitor this and collect some data about it and we can talk about it. And even if she's lying, she's still thinking about it. That's still going to facilitate our conversation. It's not about accuracy. It's not reward based. It's just about bringing that power to her. So another example is an older student. This was a middle school student and we were in this this was a group we did at the office. And she was struggling with task initiation, specifically um, when her dad would ask her to do things around the house. And so um, we were talking about it. We we're trying to brainstorm, like, what type of data could you collect with this? How could you do this? And she said, um, well, you know, I guess I could keep track of how many times my dad has to ask me to do something before I do it. And I said, okay, well, let's figure out a way to track that. She was, yeah, but if I have to keep track of it, I know I'm just going to do it the first time. <laughs> And I left. I was like, she's on to me <laughs> because that's the point, right? Like if we can bring it to their consciousness and help them know that they can change it, that they can influence it, then that's half the battle. And then we can look for, well, what's really getting in the way then of what you, of you initiating this task? Because it's not about being aware of it. It's about some other piece of it, but we just want to facilitate the conversation. We want to empower them to observe those things and know that they can change their behaviors, that they can build new habits. So here's another example. So Kira keeps getting in trouble for being late. Her parents get mad at her in the morning because she's late for the bus. She's been getting tardies at school. She's forgotten her violin for school several times. So when she's discussing the situation, Kira notes that she likes having a few minutes of extra time in the morning because she can use it to go play basketball before it's time to leave, but she never has time for that anyway. I think exactly how it came across. So, um, so we were like, okay, well, let's just, what are we gonna keep track of? Here? So we decided like, how often is she finished with her morning routine on time? By the way, her, her mother was like, she often gets to play basketball. She the, like, but it was like always focused on that negative piece. So how often am I finished with my morning routine? How am I using that time? So this was the little chart that we came up with. So you can tell we met on a Tuesday. So therefore it started on a Wednesday. <laughs> so getting dressed, eating breakfast, brushing teeth, shoes on, done by seven o'clock. Yes or no? If no, what time was it done? Again, not judgmental, not in trouble, just we're just collecting data here. 
if she was done in time, how did she use the extra time? And then, then the next step was, was she also then, that transition was also sometimes difficult. So were you then in the car and ready to leave by eight o'clock? So similar thing there. So this was interesting. You know, we started collecting the data. And so what Kira knows was that actually she had, she had time to do it probably more than half of the days. She got to play some basketball, but also just even tracking it, again, it brought it to her consciousness. And so then she would kind of intentionally work through that a little bit more. And so because she really felt empowered and successful, she just wanted to keep working on that and doing that. This was really an interesting situation because um, as I was talking to the parent about this, the parent was going, well, so what if, so what if she's not ready? What if she's not getting that time? What if she's still not ready to get, you know, to go at eight o'clock, you know, should we, should we take away video game time? Or what if she doesn't fill out the chart? I think that was the other part too. Like, what if she doesn't fill it out? What if she, what if, she, and I'm like, well, I don't care whether or not she fills out the chart. Like if you want to prompt her to fill out the chart, that would be great, but she doesn't get in trouble for not filling out the chart. That's not, that's not our goal here. And I think if you tie it to a reward or a punishment, you just undermine the entire process there. Um, but the other thing was, you know, if you want to take, if your consequence in your house is that you take away video game time for not being ready in the morning, that's your decision, but it's not, to, it's not related to this. And just know that like, that's fine, but you're not teaching any skills with that, right? And I, I think that's sometimes where we get, where we get caught with stuff with rewards and punishments. Um, ultimately, they're just really not effective. Like it might, or, or it's effective in the very, very short term, right? It might get you compliance in that moment, but it's not teaching the skill, it's not teaching the self-regulation and it's not overall building any of the, the um, empowerment and, and confidence that we want in our kids that they can regulate those things on their own because it's all externally regulated by us, by offering that punishment or, or giving that reward. And for what it's worth, I don't know, I don't wanna, I'm gonna say it anyway, but <laughs> <laughs> for what it's worth, you know, people will, will sometimes, you know, feel like, as long as it's positive, as long as it's something that they're earning or whatever, then it's better than somehow punish like a punishment or taking something away. But ultimately it's like the same thing. It's like two sets. Cause, because if you, then if you don't administer that reward, then that's just, like mentally, that's the same as a punishment. Like you've now not given the thing. So you've taken away the thing that you were going to give. You see what I'm saying here? So don't get too caught up in, it's like, if you do it, it's fine. But what I would often encourage people to do, and I don't, I don't know that I have all of this in this presentation specifically about motivation, but when we talk about letting kids self-regulate, if they have a goal for something they want to earn, how can we put them in charge of determining whether or not they've earned it? That's really the switch. If we are the ones determining whether or not they've earned something, then it's external regulation. If we put them in charge of it, about saying, you know, my goal is to have five days of whatever, and then maybe we talk to them through and we make a little scoring guide or a rubric about what those skills look like at home. And then we ask them to reflect on that. And they're the ones who are determining whether or not they've met it. If we can kind of step away from that and just be kind of along the side of that with them, that's a much more powerful way to help them build those self-regulation skills. So. You can use that metacognitive cycle, like I said, for emotional regulation, executive functioning, or whatever skill it is. Being kind to siblings. What are the times that you're getting arguing with your sibling? Literally all of the time. That's my house right now. So, um, so skill number four that I talk about is effective communication. So one thing that I, I like to talk about too, especially for neurodivergent kids um, and often kids who are, who are autistic, I should back up for a second. You may notice that I use identity first language as opposed to person first language. So I, I will say an autistic student or, or an ADHD or, um, and the reason that I do that is because the neurodiversity community really has embraced those terms and, and basically reclaimed them. This actually started in the disability rights movement in the deaf community. People aren't, they aren't a person with deafness. It, they are a deaf person. And they, they said, this is part of who I am. You can't take this away from me and have me be the same person. 
So in psychology and education, though, we, are, we have definitely been trained to use person-first language. So a person with autism or a person with ADHD, um, I tend to default to what, well, of course I default to what any individual person prefers, but in general, the neurodiversity community has reclaimed those. And what I often point out is that you'll notice when we're talking about giftedness, what do we say? You say a gifted student or a gifted kid. We don't say a student, <laughs> a student with gifts, you know, or with giftedness. And why is that? Well, because it's a value statement, right? But somebody who's neurodivergent, who is autistic or an ADHD, or they're not broken. That's just part of who they are. And we want them to own that and embrace it. So that's my perspective. If you have a different, you are welcome to have whatever opinion you want about that. But I just always feel like I should, I should, I should have said that at the beginning. I usually do, and I kind of forgot. So um, anyway, back to empathy. And specifically as we're talking about. Um, I think a lot of times, especially with kids who are, who are twice exception or who are autistic, a lot of times people will say, well, you know, autistic individuals don't have any empathy. And I just want to tell you that is a myth. That is not true. <laughs> that is, that's absolutely false. There are two different types of empathy. There's cognitive empathy. Cognitive empathy has to do with how I recognize or predict what somebody else is thinking. Can I guess what's going through your head while I'm thinking about something? That's cognitive empathy. Then you have affective empathy. Affective empathy is I know how that person is feeling because I've either been through that or they've expressed to me how they're feeling and I can feel alongside you. Sometimes some autistic individuals struggle with the cognitive empathy piece. They struggle with the imagining what somebody else is thinking part of it and guessing and predicting what that is. But I will tell you that almost all of the autistic individuals I've ever met in my life are some of the most empathetic and compassionate people that I've ever met as far as the affective empathy goes. And so we wanna really recognize that when we're talking about helping kids develop effective communication, because what they might be struggling with sometimes when they're trying to communicate is that they, they, don't, know, they don't know what you're thinking. So we need to be really explicit. We need to tell them what we're thinking if they struggle with that cognitive empathy, um, but also really validating the fact that they do often have that really strong affective empathy. We also need to recognize that a lot of times neurodivergent kids don't, well, I would say not just 2E kids, but gifted kids who are also neurodivergent. They don't always recognize these whole power hierarchies that we have. They don't get the logic of all of it. They think it's sometimes kind of nonsense. That can be really difficult in a setting like the school where it is very hierarchical. Like it is, you know, and, and um, <laughs> one of the things for me, I can think back on clients that I had, you know, even when I was beginning my clinical practice. And when, when I had somebody who would really insist that respect had to be a two-way street from the very beginning, I would recognize like, oh yeah, they, they're not seeing any of this here. And if you ask them to play that game where you need to give respect to your teachers or your parents or whoever it is, even though they haven't extended that already to you, they're just going to go, yeah, no. <laughs> and so when, when we really want kids to be able to have effective communication, though, we do have to try to help them understand that, first of all, these, whether or not they exist or not, whether or not they are just or not. <laughs> Some people expect them to be this way. And so if you want to be able to communicate effectively with your teachers, we might need to help them do some scripting, some understanding. Um, I have a client who's a, who's a 2E kid and um, he's a junior in high school this year. And he took a class at the community college over the summer, a computer programming class. And you know, his mom and I had talked about it. He was very excited. As a matter of fact, his, his dad is a, like a, is an engineer of some kind and his um, his dad was actually going to take this class with him but then logistics and scheduling didn't work out but that was that was supposed to be like kind of the the buffer right dad was going to take the class with him it was funny actually they were talking it's the community college right this this dad has like multiple master's degrees in, in all of these engineering things and they they needed all of his transcripts and everything before they would let him enroll in this beginning level computer programming course and so anyway Dad didn't end up taking the class with him because of scheduling issues, but he still wanted to take it. So we tried to prep him. We tried to talk to him a little bit and kind of just explain to him what this was going to be like. But this professor was so awesome because in the syllabus, they spent the first week of class. This is how you address me. 
this is how you write an email to me. This is how, you know, this is, these are the procedures that you need to follow in order, you know, for this to be successful and for you to be successful. And it was so wonderful. And I suspect that this professor must just get a lot of neurodivergent kids in this class because it's an introductory level class to computer programming. Um, but it was great because once the explicit instruction was there, once my client was told what he needed to do, that was fine. He was more than willing to do it. And in a lot of ways, that was the professor showing respect. It wasn't a demand, like you have to, you know, treat me a certain way or, or recognizing this power, power hierarchy, but it was just very explicit. Like this is the type of communication that you need to be successful in a college environment. And so the more we can do that for kids, the more we can break things down into those very discrete steps, the better. I think another thing about building effective communication, you know, a lot of times for, for kids who struggle, um, we talk about building social skills. Building social skills is fine, but it is also basically a way to teach kids to mask in a lot of ways. And so I like to talk about building social acuity instead, which means I'm reading the situation, I'm making some decisions about how I'm going to act, um, but it's not just about matching what somebody else is doing. It's a, it's a much more autonomous process for them. But when we talk about using strengths-based instruction or strengths-based um, interventions for kids, finding like-minded peers is, is huge because who wants to go to a social skills group and practice effective communication with kids who you don't have anything in common with, who you're not interested in talking to? If you notice, if you get two neurodivergent kids together and have them talk about Pokemon or whatever it might be, you'd be amazed that those quote unquote social skills, like any of those deficits are just gone. Well, why is that? Well, it's because you're, it's a strength-based situation. You're building on the things that they already know and that they can do. So let's focus on that. And if there are some skills that we wanna help them with, if we wanna help them with some of that acuity, addressing that in, in advance, but then giving them the opportunity to talk to like-minded peers to practice those skills is going to be much more effective than putting them in a forced situation that isn't really very realistic. For what it's worth with effective communication and some of those um, social communication pieces, ultimately, I think that um, most, most 2 e kids, they know what the rules are. They know what the thing is. Like if you ask them, they can tell you what the expectation is, but in the moment they struggle with always putting it into place. And then last thing, I kind of mentioned this with this other one, but creating scripts with kids is huge. I don't, I mean, I come up with scripts. I, I kind of plan things out or I'll, it's like, especially if I have to have, so at my office, I have eight other clinicians who work with me and I'll be honest, I, I might be a little bit like, <laughs> I don't really like being in charge. I don't like being in, you know, the boss of people. I'm not very good at it because, because it feels weird. I don't know. And so, so if I have to have a difficult conversation with somebody, I definitely Make it, it's not necessarily a script, but it is a list, and I have to have it in writing because I promise I will, I will, I will wimp out. <laughs> I just like to smooth things over. I'm like I don't really ruffle any feathers, but creating scripts can help us have effective communication, and it, and that's the same for kids. Like, let's talk through what what is it exactly that you want to say. You want to self advocate. How are you going to do that? How are you going to talk to your peer about this particular situation, whatever it might be. So the last piece here is self directed motivation. And this is super hard, but I want to say, I've never met a kid who's unmotivated. I've never met a kid who's lazy. There's a great book by a psychologist, um, Dr. Devin Price, who wrote a book called Laziness Does Not Exist. Dr. Devin Price is also um, autistic as well and will and has some other, I think, what's, what's the books that she wrote recently, that they wrote recently about autism? Um, I can't remember what it's called. But anyway, they have another more recent one that's come, that has recently come out. Um, so self-directed motivation. There are three pieces that we really need for kids to have self-directed motivation. So I'm going to talk about this just real quickly. So those three ingredients come from self-determination theory of motivation. So self-determination theory of motivation really looks at intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation, but also recognizing that there are very few things in life that are truly intrinsic or truly extrinsic. Most things are along a continuum. So for example, um, 
If you have a job that you really enjoy and you get paid for it, they identify that as integrated regulation because you enjoy the job and you're getting this extrinsic piece to it, but it's self-determined. I value this task and I get something out of it, right? They also, the next, um, they also have what's called, now I'm not gonna remember the name off the top of my head, integrated, wait, that was, what did I just say the last one was? I should have pulled this up. Well, there's, okay, I'm just gonna go with the other terms. There's intrinsic, the next one is bonus, right? That's the integrated. I don't know what, my, my brain is failing me here, sorry. Um, where you get the bonus. The next one is going for a goal, right? So I don't really care about this thing, but I do value the thing that I will get at the end of it. So I don't care about this class, but it's a prerequisite for the class I want to take. So I'm self-determining my level of motivation there. Those are the three levels of self-determined motivation. Beneath that, you have levels that are more extrinsic or externally regulated. So you have social expectations. I don't care about this, but society, my parents, my teachers tell me I have to. So I'm gonna do this thing. So that's externally regulated. Beneath that, you have prizes and punishments. So that's external regulation, where's the carrot and the stick, right? And then the last level is a motivation. When we recognize that kids can be in those top three tiers, in those self-directed levels of motivation, even if they don't care about the thing that they're doing, but they value something at the end, and they are the ones who are determining what that value is, that's much more empowering for them to move toward that task. So we wanna to try to find ways to move them to that place. Sometimes there are some things that we do just based on social expectations, right? Sometimes there are things as adults, like speeding tickets, for example, prizes and punishments, like it's, there's a very strict boundary there. <laughs> so we are motivated to follow the speed limit because we don't wanna to have to pay for a speeding ticket. So these three ingredients for motivation though, if you have a child who's struggling with motivation, I would ask you, you could look at executive functioning, right? Executive functioning sometimes can appear like a lack of motivation, but it might just be executive dysfunction. But if they're truly unmotivated by a task, look at these three areas and see if there's one that you notice that's really influencing their overall um, level of, of integration with this. So the first one is agency or also autonomy. This is huge. And I think that a lot of times we really, um, I've talked about autonomy and independence quite a bit throughout this presentation, but I want you to think about a time that you were in a situation where you had very little autonomy or no sense of agency. And I want you to think about how motivated you were about that task. It's, it's really difficult to, to feel energized about something if you feel like you're just going through the motions that somebody else has put in place for you. So we really wanna give kids a sense of agency. Can I have power to make some decisions? Do I have any way to, to have some control in this situation? And if not, especially for our neurodivergent kids, they might just throw up their hands and go, not, they're not gonna do that. <laughs> I don't have any control over it. So we wanna give them that sense of agency. The next piece is competence. And again, I've talked about competence quite a bit during this presentation, finding that just right level of challenge. It's not too hard. It's not too easy. How do we help kids get to that point where we're not asking them to do something that is too difficult, um, but we're also not making them go through the motions of something that they already know how to do. That's really important for our bright kids because I don't know about you, but I wanna do something boring. My fifth grade teacher, um, one of the assignments that we had to do every, it was the week that it was always assigned on the day that I was gone at my gifted ed program, right? But we had to write our spelling words five times each. So, so I won the spelling bee, like in, in third grade, I run, won the class spelling bee. I was runner up in fifth grade. I won it in sixth grade. I don't know what happened in fourth grade. I don't remember the spelling bee. I must've been absent that day. Um, but anyway, and I could promise you that as an adhd -er who already knew how to spell all those words, not only did I not have any sense of agency over it, my only way to get any sense of agency or autonomy over it was to not do it. So that's what I opted to do. But also it was a sense of competence. I will tell you that if she had given me harder spelling words, I would have eaten that up. I would have done it in a minute. I don't know that I would have written them five times each, but I would have learned them. Maybe, maybe I would have, eh, that's maybe asking a lot. I would have learned them. I would have enjoyed that. And I would have done other tests if she had made it more challenging for me. But that was, but those sorts of things. So basically it just ended up in this huge power struggle. I wouldn't do it. She would give me a zero. I still wouldn't do it. She would give me a zero. I would stay in from recess and still not do it. So eventually I ended up failing spelling at least one quarter in fifth grade. 
I also lost in spell when I was the runner up in fifth grade. I lost on um, the word quarantine, which really has been kind of traumatic for living the last couple of years. <laughs> but that's okay. I'm getting through it. No, but we want to make sure that kids have that sense of agency and competence. And then the last thing is connection, feeling trust, feeling rapport, feeling like they have a connection is so huge. And you know, hopefully as parents, you're in a different situation. When I work with teachers and I talk about this connection, it's so important that we give kids time to go at their own pace, that we don't push them too fast or too far. And you know, when you're dealing with neurodivergent kids, it's so important to recognize that just throw the milestones out the window of, you know, that when we're talking about development, kids will get there. I promise you they'll get there. I've worked with a lot of kids in, you know, over a pretty long time where I've seen them from elementary school all the way up through adulthood. And just because they don't do it at all of the same timelines as their peers doesn't mean that they won't get there. It doesn't mean that they're broken or that there's anything wrong with them. It just, they're on their own trajectory and that's fine. Focus on the progress, focus on the fact that you're, you're getting there and focus on this relationship and this connection because if you have this piece of it, you're gonna make it like just a million times easier for them. They're gonna know that they can come to you. They're gonna know that they can take risks and that it's safe and that they can be successful. So um, I know that that's really hard when you have a kiddo who's really struggling, but um, I, haven't, I haven't seen a kiddo yet who hasn't gotten to that point. So um, that's all I have. So if we have questions and answer, yep. Well, if you have questions, I might have answers. Um, if you have answers too, that's wonderful. I would love to hear your answers for, for questions because I think that's the other thing is recognizing that, you know, we're all kind of experts in, in, in handling different situations and have, can learn from each other as well. So um, any questions about anything? Yes. How are you defining connection in that scenario? Um, rapport and trust and recognizing that um, like that we are pushing in a pushing and challenging in a way that still provides kids a safe place to fail. And so um, I think that that's a big piece of that. One thing that I will also say when we're talking about connections specifically related to academics is that sometimes kids might have a teacher that they do not get along with but if they have a strong connection to the content that they're learning, that can actually also be a type of a relationship or a connection, right? Where they're so passionate about this thing that it doesn't really matter if I get along with this teacher so much or not, that I can, I can supplement that with, with my connection to whatever this topic is. Um, I think, you know, in general, when we're talking about motivation though, if, if we feel really disconnected and it, from a parent or a teacher or whatever. If we don't feel like we're safe in those situations, it's very difficult to do risk, to, to take any sort of risk. And when we're talking about being motivated about something, we have to feel safe in order to, to move forward in those, in those areas. So, yeah. What else? I just wanna share, oh, go ahead. If you have a child who's struggling in a specific area, how do you, it's like much more complex than just a simple, I'm speaking out of turn or something yeah. like that, break it down to that chart level, which was yeah, super great tool. How do you investigate enough to be able to break it down? Into yeah. chart? Like, how do you look at this big picture and take it into some bite-sized pieces? Sure. So what I would say with that is, um, Without getting into specifics, I, here, here's maybe, uh, this is a very broad example, but if you kind of consider it like a funnel, right? And you talk to a child about what their big picture goal is. So my big picture goal is that I wanna get better grades or I wanna be more organized or I wanna manage my emotions or whatever. And then you can break it down into what I call like the building block skills. So just brainstorming, like what are four or five things that kind of go into this task? Because if you focus on the big picture thing, you're right, it's way too broad. You can't there's nothing there to track or you just kind of get lost in it. So once you kind of brainstorm, it's like, well, 
I want to be more organized. It's like, well, what could I do? Well, it's like I could, I could use a planner. I could, I could, you know, um, check my online, you know, Google Classroom or whatever daily. Like, what are those particular skills? And then the next part of it is you just pick one of those. And even though it might seem like a drop in the bucket, start there. That's okay. And then you figure out how do I track that particular piece. I think one of the things that I've really seen with kids is that once they start to build a sense of self-efficacy, it does kind of generalize and it gives you a little bit more direction on where to go with it. So, but I, I hear what you're saying because a lot of times it's like, oh my gosh, where do we even start with this? Pick something that they'll be successful with. Like it does, like anywhere you start is, is, is good because when it's adjustable anyway, if you get through it and you're like, okay, this was a terrible, we were not able to, to track this in any real way, shape or form scrap it <laughs> just go okay that was not great let's what did we learn from this and how can we try it again in a different way and just kind of keep plugging away at it you might you know the time that you spend tracking it might be a day it might be an hour it might be a week it could be like you can adjust the length of time for it as well so that i think gives a little bit more flexibility yeah yes i can i'm not really sure what my question is yet i'm hoping it'll get there. but for a kiddo who in you know, sixth grade who really struggles with like peer relationships mm -hmm. and that whole idea of like social expectations and knowing how to initiate play, knowing what to do when he wants to do something that the other kids don't want to do, or he's doing things that are quote unquote annoying and mm -hmm. not stopping when the other kids are asking. So I guess like how do you work through that when I'm like I'm not the parent of those other children right I can't be there when it's happening and it's like I feel like he he's being he has a lot of support and he's being taught a lot of those skills on I guess social norms yeah but then when you say things like is that really just masking I don't you know yeah and then the whole idea of like he's not broken Right. He's just different than you. But right. Like, how do you come alongside yeah. your child and I'm like, I can't help you. I'm not there. Yeah. What does he want? He wants those relationships. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, does he have, has he, has he, so I, questions I would ask, like, when has he found success? You know, if there are any times when it's been more successful than others. Um, and also helping him realize like, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned that. So my daughter's in seventh grade and she's kind of, she's kind of has some of those same, um, same pieces where she gets a lot of negative feedback mm -hmm. from her friends. Well, peers. Yes. Yeah. And um, it is hard because while you want to maybe, you can teach some of those skills, like for example, like that might be quote unquote masking. Mm -hmm. But I think maybe the way to do that and handle that is to be really explicit with your child about it. Like um, here, what was the situation with Maggie recently? She, um, I think it was, I'm, I'm sure it was probably something on the bus and she likes to lecture people about the things that she feels, well, lecture, advocate, I don't know, pick a word. She likes to tell people her opinions about things. And then people like to get on her case. So she, you know, she is a very adamant um, social justice uh, uh, warrior and, and really has some very clear ideas about what the way things should be. And so then when things don't go <laughs> the way that she would like to, then she gets feedback and she's like, well, they're bullying me. I'm like, well, Mag, here's the thing. You have two choices. You can either advocate for those things if that's what you want to do, but you have to realize that you will get negative feedback because that's just kind of the world. Or you can choose not to say anything, but those are your choices there, right? So, so you know, and recognizing like, do I want her to have to hide those things about herself? Do I want her to have to stifle those things? No, but also like that's kind of just, like that's kind of the reality. So she has to make that choice. So she doesn't want to have that that exposure to that. So in your situation though, um, you know, maybe talking about those skills and recognizing like here are your options of how you could choose to behave. Do you, do you think a lot of it is like, is it impulse? Yeah. 
Um, like, yeah, I don't think he even has the cognitive awareness that like he can make that decision that Maggie's making. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't think, I don't think Maggie's making the decision. I just right. let her know that it is a possibility <laughs> that that she could make the decision. <laughs> I, it's a lot of like maybe after the fact he can know the right answer, yeah, right. but it's like in the moment, it's like forget about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean. You know, I think one of the hardest things about that is recognizing that as he gets older, some of those skills will develop. And I truly believe that they will. And I think also, like, I think a lot of our 2E kids um, end up finding the connections at, at a time. It just, it's just complicated to make friends in general. Right, we've had so many of these conversations and I feel like as he's getting older, is it's it getting harder? harder? Yeah. Because he's so emotionally yeah. immature and he's had like a lot of trauma in his life too, which yeah. I think brings him either yep. lower. Yeah. Um, so I mean he's a young sixth grader to begin with. Yeah. But then really emotionally is like first or second grader. Yeah. And it's like when he has those really over when when his reaction does not match the problem. Yeah. And he becomes over the top then it's, yeah, his friends are less forgiving because yeah. like when you were six, like, oh, everybody yeah. gets mad, whatever, right. we're right. still friends. Right. Now they're like, yeah, that's not normal. Yeah, they don't have as much patience for him. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know that I, I guess my, my, my encouragement to you is just knowing that it's a process and that you can still encourage. And, and you're right. I think as it gets, as kids get older, um, those those social expectations from their peers definitely change. And so that's one of the reasons why in the DSM, it talks about how some of the social communication difficulties may not fully manifest until those, those expectations outpace the demands, um, which is why a lot of 2E kids especially get diagnosed specifically like with autism much later than their same age peers. Um, but, you know, if there are ever any times where he is successful, or if there are ever any interests that he's super into, and if you can find opportunities to, to even just connect, you know, shorter opportunities to connect kind of more structured, sometimes it's a little bit easier to kind of develop some of those, those skills at their pace. Um, you know, hopefully, hopefully that will help. And hopefully the teachers are able to kind of help guide him a little bit more and let him be his authentic self. And also, help the other kids know how to interact with kids who are neurodivergent. Like That's it's a two-way street. the hardest part. Yeah. And like his 2E teacher is phenomenal. Yeah. And I really like, it really hit us this summer when it was his birthday and we just invited like his little 2E class. And prior to that, I really had probably like unfair um, ideas of like, you know, he would complain he wasn't, I don't have any play dates, and, yeah. you know, my sister can always play dates, and I'm thinking, like, that's because she has friends, and you don't, because yeah. you treat people like crap, you know, like, the what I thought, and, like, when he had his, like, little 2 e friends at his birthday party, and I was, like, oh, my gosh, like, these kids are just like you, and I'm, like, they're truly your friends, like, they really yeah. like you, like, right, so yeah, and, it's like, just, and, like, now, it's, like, he is having play dates, and he's going to his house, yeah. and I'm, like, so it's like when you said somewhere in your yeah. presentation about like like-minded peers, yeah. and I was like, wow. it's huge, huge. Yeah, I, I I have been amazed at the underground world of Pokemon tournaments, like <laughs> things that I it's like, oh, this is where you know. But anyway, I'm happy to stay and answer a few more questions. Oh, is that okay? Is there one online? Okay, yeah. Question from online. My two E, if you have time. Yes. Yeah. My no, that's okay. I just don't. I want to be respectful of <laughs> other people's time as well. Okay. My two E is so great with something like a task chart at home. Expectations at home, hygiene, one chore a day, simple expectations. And then after a month, it wears off and no longer works. Will I have to come up with something new that often? Talking, talking me, wait, taking me, telling him what to do out of the equation helps, but I'm running out of ways to do it. <laughs> I would, I think if he's, if he's too e like, ask him to find the loopholes in advance or like come up with some of the strategies. So like, I think that's one of the things when we set expectations for kids is that if, if we're, if we know they're good at finding the loopholes or if we know that they're going to find a way to kind of lose interest, like, okay, what's, 
let's talk this through. Okay, let's find all the loopholes first and make sure we close those up and we can handle it that way. But also I would bring him into the process and say, what, you know, reflect back, what worked, what didn't. Okay, this lost interest, how can we tweak it? How can we find just a little bit of a way to make it a little bit new or novel to make it more interesting to reinvigorate that process? It is exhausting, I get it. I mean, I, I feel your pain, but I think, you know, the fact that you're getting a month out of something though, honestly, like I think there are a lot of people who would be like, oh, if I could just get something for a month, but you, you know, it's, it's, it's a process. For <laughs> so um, anyway, okay. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. Value your time. Yeah. Um, we are very lucky and we have two books that I'm going to um, be sharing. I used my randomizer on my phone mm -hmm. and I need Mara Michaels. Yay. There you go. Thank you. And um, Dan O'Leary. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And we do want to thank you. Yes. Um, no, thank you for having me. Thank you. Much. Thank you, everyone, for coming. We greatly appreciate it. Um, we will be continuing to um, have opportunities. Um, to share with Emily and get information from her throughout this year. So we're gonna be watching for that because it will be coming. Um, have a great evening. Thank you so much. Oh, Maggie. Yes. Well, Maggie didn't know I was gonna throw her under the bus there. But <laughs> she's at the hotel room right now. She so. won't. We won't. We'll, 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 we'll give you a point. Yeah. Oh, that's your back question. You're not local. No, so, St. Louis. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I know. Oh, she did. 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 O